everybody, and welcome to Wyoming Institute for Humanity Research's Think and Drink series of virtual talks. Uh, we hope everybody is as well as can be expected with what's going on in the world right now. Um, I'm Dr. Jennifer Harmon, an associate professor in the Design, Merchandising, and Textiles program and a member of the Wyoming Institute for the Humanities Research Steering Committee. Tonight's conversation is entitled Que Pasa, Professora? I hope I did an okay job of pronouncing that. Uh, a conversation about scholarly projects in modern and classical languages. In just a moment, I'll introduce tonight's moderator who will introduce our speakers, but just a couple of technical notes, especially if you haven't been with us before. If you want to see all of the speakers, you can press gallery view. And if you just want to see the current speaker only, you can press that same button again and toggle it to speaker view. You can type comments and questions into the chat and we will all be able to see them. If you just want to direct a comment to our speakers, <clears throat> you can type it into the Q&A box and they will be the only ones able to see those. If you'd like to keep in touch with us, please send an email to humanities at uwyo.edu and we'll add you to our mailing list. Um, I'll type that into the comment box in just a second. You can also watch recordings of our past events on our YouTube channel. If you go to YouTube and just type Wyoming Institute for Humanity Research in the search bar, you'll see all of our previous recordings. Tonight's moderator is Dr. Nancy Small from the Department of English. Dr. Small is an assistant professor and also a member of the Wyoming Institute for the Humanities Research Steering Committee. So please welcome Nancy and all of our speakers who uh, you've heard talking in the background already. So welcome everybody. I'll turn it over to Nancy. Thanks, Jennifer. So buenas tardes or good afternoon to our audience and to our panelists. And thank you to Stephanie Stahl, WIRE's talented project coordinator for designing the flyer and poster and for facilitating the technology for this event. WIRE creates a wide range of really wonderful opportunities for folks interested in and working in the humanities at the University of Wyoming. A showcase event, the Sandine Lecture in the Humanities is coming up soon. So please mark your calendars for December 13th. The Sandine Lecture is delivered via Zoom and Dr. Tracy Owens Patton will be sharing her work on race, history and, and family in a talk titled, Womb Wars, Mixed Race Children and Whiteness in the Post-Nazi Era. Another great opportunity WIRE provides is the Humanities Research Group Fellows Program. It's a competitive program that active humanities scholars apply to join each year. And if selected, the faculty member receives generous resources, time through a course release and or money for things like books, research assistance or research related travel. All of these things in support of their research project. The fellows then meet, forming a wonderful community for discussion uh, peer mentoring and feedback on their scholarly work. I was lucky to be a research group fellow last year and can say the time and space it creates are incredibly helpful for the knowledge making part of our university jobs. So now to our think and drink or more appropriately, piensa y bebe. The four professoras we have with us tonight have all been part of this humanities research group. And I thought it would be fun to know more about what research in modern languages looks like. So sometimes research in our different fields can feel a little bit like silos or black boxes, even for those of us that work at the university. And if we don't get a chance to interact on these projects, then we really don't know what each other is doing. So in that spirit of que pasa, or what's going on, we gather around the table for some thinking and drinking to learn about and celebrate the work of these doctoras and previous research fellows awardees. I've asked each participant to prepare some brief and informal remarks up to about five minutes, sharing with us what their projects were during their research fellowship. But research activities at the university are always ongoing and broader than just the fellowship experience. So I've encouraged them to talk about other projects as well. Once we've gone around the table, then they may speak back to one another, noting connections or interesting differences or asking questions about each other's projects. I think I'll, I'm sure I'll have some questions too. <laughs> so please, please though, the big goal here is for the audience to interact. So drop your comments and questions as Jennifer noted into the chat or the Q and A and we'll bring y'all into the discussion too. So without further delay, I'll now turn it over to our panel of professors. It's my honor to introduce <coughs> Dr. 
she knows I've been messing with trying to get her name right. And she keeps telling me how Dr. Joy Londa Londata, professor of Spanish and department chair of modern and classical languages, Dr. Conchita Dominac, professor of Spanish, Dr. Irina Czech Agorcia, associate professor of Spanish, and Dr. Chelsea Escalante, assistant professor of Spanish. Muchas gracias for being here, profesoras. Let's get started by hearing from Joy about her work. Thank you, Nancy. That was just a marvelous introduction. And uh, I'm glad you're the moderator today to, to lead us through this. Um, you understand what fellows have, uh, what these wire fellowships have meant to everyone. And the reason I'm going first is because I was in the first cohort. I was a charter member the, the first time it was introduced, and that was a spring of 2019. Uh, our, the new director, at, new at the time, Scott Henkel, had this great idea of having the um, having groups of eight people who were fe fellows who were working together in a real interdisciplinary fashion. And I think it was, for me, it was the first time I really had that experience at UW to be on an interdisciplinary cohort. And he defined humanities as humanities writ large. And, by, I, and it's a really great way to have us be together because we were in my cohort, at least the very first one, which was kind of experimental. Um, we had people that were doing humanities related projects, but maybe weren't particularly humanists. And that was um, really nice because then we started to see that we're all humanists in, in, in our approach for many things. So it was an absolutely wonderful uh, start. And I, and I think I inspired the people you see here and encouraged them to, um, try to get to also do the competitive thing and, and be on uh, future ones. And, they, and all, all of the people to here today were chosen for the, to be fellows in the different semesters. And there's also two other people from modern and classical languages who aren't here tonight, but I'm sure they'll be invited to a different think and drink. Uh, Sonia Rodriguez Hicks is also in Spanish. She's currently doing hers, so she hasn't finished her project yet. Um, and we have one person from German, Becky Steele, who um, ha has already done hers, but she'll probably be on a different one that's not so specific to Spanish uh, because she's in German. So actually six of us have already participated since the very first cohort was uh, developed and invented. And, uh, and it was just a great idea. Um, so the, of the eight people that were in our original cohort, um, we chose together, we picked the person that would be giving the Sandine lecture. And that was really important. The year I was there, it was Rachel Saylor. It was just a marvelous um, chance for us to all work together and put in our input and look at each what each other had done. And we chose Rachel's because it was a, really a fine way to represent humanities in Wyoming and the work that she had done. So that got to be the um, Sandine lecture. Um, and I know I'm talking more about the overall setup, but I kind of want everybody to have a sense of what really happens when you're a research fellow. So for me, the two big memories were the interdisciplinarity and the, of course the chance to a friendship, the friendship across the campus with people I had didn't know before or I didn't have a working if friendship with. And several of those people are still my close friends and we do things together now. Um, one of my hobbies or skills in, about writing is editing. And so there were a couple of people in, in that group where we, I was talking to them about editing and language. Uh, because there was one person who whose first language wasn't English, but was required to write in English for the paper they were producing. So we ended up spending a lot of extra time outside the um, cohort working on editing the English and getting it more, um, more easily readable for the um, journal that it was destined to. And then I made another friendship with someone else who had a 
a project in another discipline, but that coincided with some of my interests. So, and, and we even, I even met somebody else who had a hobby interest that was related to mine that has nothing to do with my research, but that has to do with car repair. So we had a great chance to become friends inside and outside the research arena. Um, the other thing I'd like to tell you about what we did uh, when we got started was we, we had a book, we, we were given this book, and I don't even know, maybe that's a good question for the others, if did you all get this book? This was the book we got, The Elements of Academic Style, Writing for the Humanities by Eric Hayat. And so it, it's a good, it was a great gift and it was a good read. And there's some suggestions in there that I have followed. So here I'm sort of telling you about some of the research I've done. One of the suggestions that he tells you is that you should start with an excellent anecdotal introduction. So the last paper I wrote, I thought, well, I'm going to follow, and I'm going to look at this book and see what Hyatt says, and I'm going to come up with an excellent anecdotal introduction. And that was a paper that I was writing about two authors who met in Wyoming, that neither one is from Wyoming, but they are essential to knowing about things that happened in Wyoming. And that was Owen Wister, who is well known for the, uh, the Virginian, which was a, a cowboy cowboy novel uh written about medicine bow wyoming which is just just down the road from laramie uh and um about ernest hemingway and uh i had done previously my work was on ernest hemingway in spain then i wanted to work about ernest hemingway in wyoming and owen wister in wyoming who met uh and so when i wanted to do the excellent anecdotal introduction. I wanted to tell the anecdote about Worcester and Hemingway meeting for meeting in Wyoming, and then basically getting into a fight, but Ernest Hemingway was always getting into fights uh, because Worcester wanted to read the proofs to Ernest Hemingway's book before it was released, and Hemingway didn't like that. Uh, so, uh, and of course, Worcester had suggestions he wanted to make and Hemingway didn't want those suggestions easier either. So um, I think it's a great, excellent anecdotal introduction to my work on comparing uh, two short stories. What I, what I was comparing was a short story by Owen Wister um, called The Honorable The Strawberries and a short story by Hemingway which is wine of Wyoming. It takes place in Wyoming. And the, what's interesting about this, a lot of the work I do is bilingual or trilingual comparative literature and comparative genre. So that, um, that particular one, Ernest Hemingway writes wine of Wyoming, but it's actually in English and French uh, because he knew French well from his travels. And it's about a French woman who is a bootlegger who is making beer and wine in Wyoming and her husband, uh, where the narrator goes to this house and, and drinks wine and listens to the woman talk in French and, and bilingually French and English. And then the uh, Worcester story is, is bilingual, but not it's bilingual English in the sense of it's about a British uh, person who comes to Wyoming with all, all his typically British modismos or uh, sayings, like he'll say, I say, oh, uh, jolly good, and things like that, just like you would expect the um, stereotypes of a Britisher to be. And that language, that dialect is compared to the cowboy language of the middle of Wyoming. Um, so that anyway, that was the uh, the most recent paper I gave about that had to do that came right from Eric Hayat's suggestion about start with an excellent anecdotal introduction. So I think I'll move. I'll go to the let the next person take over from there. Thanks very much for inviting us all. We're really happy of the wonderful support we've gotten all the time from Wyoming Institute.
Institute for Humanities Research. Thank you. Conchita, I think you're up next. Thanks again, Andy. Okay. Hi. Uh, good evening. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me, for inviting us. And thank you also for the support. Uh, um, yeah, I feel very grateful uh, for all the grants and opportunities. Thank you. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my research, my current research. And um, normally, I don't have just one project. Normally, uh, I have two or more projects at the same time, and for several reasons. Uh, sometimes when you have just one project, and for instance, if it has to go to, for peer review, uh, you have to wait. Or sometimes um, I, I get tired of a project. So it's good to have like a break from that project and take it over later on. So basically right now I have two big projects and one is in the last stage. Um, and the other one is at the beginning, at the beginning. And I feel, uh, as I said before, the one who is in the uh, last stage, sometimes I have to take a break from, from it. And this one, it has been, I have been with this book uh, for eight years and is like sometimes overwhelming. Uh, this, I, uh, Almost all the books that I, I publish, I do it with a, I, I wrote them with a professor from the University of Colorado, Denver, and yes, Lemain Capier, and we work together very well. Uh, and I'm going to talk later about Cervantes, and I feel like uh, one of us is Don Quixote and the other one is Sancho, and I'm the practical one, he is the idealistic one, I'm the skinny one, he's the fat one, and not the, uh, well, he's saying not for. Um, so uh, we work very well together. And the project, the project that we are doing right now is the MLA style, um, the, the uh, English manual, we are doing an adaptation for Spanish. And as I told you, uh, it's taking eight years. Working with the MLA has been challenging. Um, we had, they look at every comma, at every period, at every everything. Uh, we had, uh, it has been re uh, uh, evaluated and reviewed by everyone. And uh, it has been good. It has been good because we got a lot of feedback and we had to work a lot um, on this. And I learned a lot. Uh, it has been challenging many times. But so how the project started, it was I, I worked for a, for a journal. And I published uh, articles in several journals. And um, what happened is that every time that I send an article for publication or they send it to me, the style is completely different. And we uh, not only have different formats like the APA, the, the APA, uh, the Chicago, the, the MLA, uh, the MLA in English and the MLA in Spanish is different because uh, what happened is that we can follow the MLA style, but sometimes the MLA style doesn't follow the rules of the Spanish, the Spanish grammar rules or the Spanish. For in, let me give you an example. In the MLA style, when you put the um, month, January, February, uh, in English, month are capitalized, but in Spanish are not capitalized. So in some journals, you have to capitalize the, the month in Spanish, like Enero, Febrero, Marzo, and this is a mistake because in Spanish we don't do that. Another thing is that the quotation marks in Spanish, we put the period outside the quotation mark, and in English, you put it inside the quotation marks. Um, and, uh, you know, I published in, uh, in, our, in journals that they told me, you have to put the period inside the, the quotation marks, even that if you write in Spanish. And I'm like, hmm, this is a mistake. This is a mistake in Spanish, but 
okay, you are publishing my article, so I will put the period inside the quotation marks. So this is a project that we are uh, finishing right now. Actually, uh, we are getting paid by the MLA, so we have to send it in less than a month. If not, we are not going to get paid. So we are working very hard to have it at the end of the month. At the same time, uh, my other project is uh, really related of uh, my area of research that is the 17th century. And as uh, I was saying at the beginning, I, um, I'm going to research about Cervantes. And actually, um, this, is, this is a project that I, I had in my mind, and it's also with Andrés Leymán Capier. We had in our mind for a long time when we did the conference, the Cervantes conference in, in Laramie. Um, we had a conference in Laramie, and scholars from all over the world uh, came. And the last, the last presentation, the closing, the closing uh, conference, it was by a professor uh, from Oxford University. Um, he is one of the best Cervantistas in, in the world. And uh, his talk was amazing. And since then, I have been thinking and thinking and thinking. And his talk was about Sancho and Don Quixote. And uh, actually, people were in shock, and especially Spaniards and especially Americans, because we view Sancho and Don Quixote as friends. We view them as friends. We think they are friends. Uh, so what he says is that, um, and you know, and it made me think about friendship and uh, a friendship as a culture as well. And, uh, and I was thinking, it's because he's British that he's thinking that Sancho and Don Quixote is, are not friends, that they are like associates or better, the master and the servant, oh, okay? So uh, he, was, uh, he was saying that this, that they were, uh, I mean, basically he was saying more things. But this made me think, and uh, you know, and I wanted to um, to study about friendship uh, in Cervantes, but not in the Quixote, in the Don Quixote, because I think it has been studying a lot already. But um, Cervantes has many friends in uh, his uh, novelas ejemplares, exemplary novels, and in the theater. For instance, one that I'm very interested in, and I'm going to finish right here, is Rinconete and Cortadillo. Rinconete and Cortadillo is a short novel. Uh, now it will be a short novel, uh, considered a short novel. And they are two, uh, what we call uh, picaros in, in Spanish, that is the picaresque that uh, there is not really an equivalent in English, but, uh, and they are good friends, they are young, and, but the Picares uh, novels in, in a, um, the typical Picares novel is just one young boy or young adult, uh, it's just one person. But Cervantes have these two friends who are two Picaros. And uh, I have been thinking, and I have been thinking about the friendship of this Rinconete and Cortadillo, these two boys, if they are really friends. And I was thinking, uh, Professor uh, Williamson will think that they are friends or that they are associate as well. So I'm working on that. Thank you. Now we done it. Thank you, Conchita. Irina, you're up. All right. Well, first of all, thank you for organizing this. Um, you know, I I try with Laura de Lucia to organize our colloquium, and one of the goals is that we get to know what each other is doing and uh, you know, and get feedback. One of the things that I loved about the, the humanities group was. Two things, I think. First was to get feedback from people that were not from my field. So they were going to have different feedback and look at different things that I wouldn't necessarily think of. Um, the second thing was reverse, was me giving feedback to projects that I 
felt like, oh, do I really have any authority here to give any feedback? Uh, you know, and nonetheless, I really try very hard to come up with things and try to be helpful and give feedback. And uh, and I think it, it's a uh, it's a really good give and take of, of people from different fields that are gonna have very different perspectives in, on what you do, you know, and vice versa. Um, so I really enjoy, it It was a mental exercise that I think we probably all should do at some point, you know. Um, that said, let me tell you a little bit about um, my research and actually I'm gonna, connected a little bit with a couple of things that Conchita noticed in her talk just now. Um, let me just quickly share one slide because if I can find it. Okay, we're gonna come here. Um, um, I One of the things that I study and that I studied from, for this cohort in particular, um, and that I'm interested in is how you acquire language and how the context, linguistic and social context in which you acquire a language might actually impact such acquisition. Uh, relatively new, but also by now, maybe even a common place is to compare uh, three modes of acquisition. The first one is um, the Nadi speaker. The Nadi speaker is in a society, we call it like that. And what we mean by that is that they are learning their first language. Uh, and this first language is the socially dominant language in the context. And that means that they're gonna acquire it at home from their families, but also at a school and in all sorts of contests, the media, you name it. So it's a constant input. Um, I was going for that to Chile and Spain because I also wanted to see if the dialect had an impact on what I wanted to study. Um, then we also look at, and I like to look at heritage speakers. Heritage speakers are also native speakers. We don't call it like that, but they really are. And uh, with the characteristic that they are learning their first language in a non-socially dominant context for that language. That language is usually a minority language. Um, it's not gonna be the dominant one. So that means that they have little to no acquisition in formal context, in particular school, and that they mostly have oral acquisition and a home and in the family with varying degrees of exposition. Some of them get a lot of input, some of them do not. So that depends. Um, for that, I was going to collect data at UC Santa Barbara. And, uh, and finally, as a second language, and, uh, you know, and as a second language, the acquisition here is only a school, okay, typically, especially for the first levels. There is very limited input. However, you do choose in, for the instruction uh, context and, and, and ways of presenting the input to maximize the effect that that input might have. Um, and why would that matter? What kind of differences we could expect in principle to find? And as you can see, I put the heritage speakers in this graphic kind of in between because for native speakers, Native speakers, heritage are also Nadis, but I'm gonna call it like the literature here, Nadis speakers for the socially dominant language. Um, they are usually fluent in a variety of registers and modalities because they have that input and that practice for all. They have little to no transfer at all from a potential, you know, another language, be that another first language, be that, you know, a, a socially dominant language. Um, they just don't typically um, have that transfer. Heritage speakers are usually fluent orally, although that depends on what kind of input they got when they were growing up. They are less fluent in formal register and written modality, or we could expect that at least. And they are heavily influenced by English transfer. In the case of the Spanish heritage speakers in the US, you know, or whatever is the socially dominant language. And then you got uh, second language speakers or learners who are usually less fluent, particularly orally, especially and with vocabulary. Um, they are reasonably adept, you know, depending on what level they are at in form of register and written modality, but they typically are better at that than the oral modality. Um, and they're heavily influenced by English transfer, okay, in the case of um, um, learners of Spanish whose first language is English. 
Um, so, and you might wonder why would you want to study their differences and their differences, and particularly how heritage speakers acquire the language, is a great window to look at what is the impact of the dominance of the language, what kind of social issues are impacting and in what ways their acquisition. It is also a really great place to look at bilingualism. There is also um, um, kind of an internal debate in the people that study heritage language speakers uh, concerning, you know, are they really like Nazi speakers? To what extent are they not? And to what extent they do are? Uh, and especially, you know, do they have what they have called an incomplete acquisition? This is a super polemic uh, term. Uh, or are they experiencing attrition or are they just evolving the language in a different way? So there's all these kinds of positions uh, that play in this field of comparing heritage speakers to native speakers and to second language learners. Um, so that's why I wanted to look at that. Now the majority of the studies that have looked and compared the, you know, typically two groups of them, typically not the three of them, but also usually they focus on one little thing. That might be gender agreement, or that might be the imperfect. Are they still doing the imperfect or are they using the predator all the time? Uh, you know, and I wanted to compare overall measures of ability. It so happened that for my doctoral dissertation, I was a study, I was using some of these measures uh, for, for grammar. And so I thought I could apply that. I used that back then for social differences, uh, but I thought maybe I can apply it to this comparison between the two, the three groups. So that was one project. And then I thought I need to look at the lexicon. Nobody's looking at vocabulary because it's so hard to look at vocabulary, it's so vast. Um, but I was introduced to some measures by a colleague that wanted to use them for a different project with second language learners. And I was like, we can use that and for this project too. And so I was using also these vocabulary measures to, to compare the three groups. Um, so that has been going on and that was my project. And initially I was going to, you know, get data from monolinguals in Spain. And then I was going to Chile to compare and I was going to Santa Barbara to get heritage speakers and, and second language learners that were enrolled in the same program. Uh, now I was going to Chile to compare Spain and Chile and these measures and see if dialect besides, you know, this type of acquisition is dialect, which I suspected not, but I wanted to check because I always get that question in conferences. Um, but I couldn't go to Chile because first in fall 2019, there was a lot of social unrest to the point that the university closed completely for months. Um, and during the spring, COVID hit, and that was that. Uh, so that was the story, but I was managed. I, I collected different data in Spain. I did other projects and it all worked out in the end. Uh, you know, and in the future, I'm looking at comparing comprehension because all of that I did was production so far. So when I compare vocabulary recognition with comprehension, with production results, uh, see if there's correlation between the vocabulary measures and the grammar measures, uh, look at errors and see what errors can tell us comparing the three groups, um, and if possible, also register. So those are like, you know, big future projects. Um, and I wanted to say there's, there's something about these projects and in particular the grammar measures that I have been thinking of because we typically compare when we compare speakers and we have standards, there's some assumptions like you first start growing sentences with subordination and when you are better, you do nominalization and you do other things, which I think is generally true, but it has presented as a universal. And the thing is, Spanish does a lot more subordination in general is my impression than English. So, you know, and this is, connecting with what Conchita was saying, you know, are we applying the standards of English to Spanish, you know, with the norms of how to write, with, you know, how we consider some, some sentence more evolved or less, or whether we're using the quotations inside or outside, those kind of things. 
So I do think there might be a little bit of a bias there in, in the sense of, you know, these are the English standards and we're sort of applying that. So that's another project and I got data recently for that other project too. Uh, but what Conchita was saying was reminded me of that as well as the, the donkey shot, you know, like interpreting, um, you know, standards of friendship according to the standards for friendship of bis or business that you might have in your culture versus that. So, you know, a few things that's also, that gets also played into like what kind of vocabulary are, the heritage speakers tend to rely a lot on cognates from English and get a lot of transfer from a vocabulary of English. The question is, is that really a transfer or are they speaking a new dialect? So that's also another question that we might wonder. And I'm gonna leave it at that. Hopefully I didn't go too long, uh, but I, I, I wanna have the opportunity to listen to Chelsea and, and to crossfire comments with everybody. So I'm gonna stop the share. Thanks, Thank Irina. You. Come on, Chelsea. Hi everyone, thank you so much for coming and thank you Nancy and Jennifer and Wire for having us here. Um, I think it is really important to share what our research, uh, what we're doing in our research because I, I'm sure as my colleagues can attest to, as Spanish um, professors we often get, or there's kind of an assumption that, that we just teach Spanish, that's what we do, which of course we do and we love it and that's great, but we also put a lot of time and effort into our research and sometimes people will ask me like very puzzled, like how do you how do you do research in Spanish? Don't you just, once you acquire the language, what else is there to know? <laughs> and so I think it's a really um, cool opportunity to get to share our research and to put it into simple terms so that everyone can understand it. Um, and that's something that WIRE really helped me do um, as we were in our groups. We, you know, we had to explain our research, give feedback and receive feedback from people who were completely, were in totally different fields that weren't related to what, you know, didn't know anything about what we studied, used different methodologies, used different forms of analysis, and we had to make our research um, really accessible to them. And, um, and then we had to access their research. And so it was a, it's a really good tool to be able to gain those skills. Um, and I think it's really, really important. So thank you so much for the opportunity and for the funding. That was really appreciated too. Um, so I, like Irene said, I was in the cohort, um, in her same cohort and also with Jennifer. Um, so it's really get, great to get to know Jennifer through that. Um, and that was, we were in the cohort that, uh, when COVID struck. <laughs> and so I started off with one project, um, for the first half of my wire fellowship, and then I had to switch it to something else. Um, so I'm just going to briefly explain kind of both of those, um, different projects that I did during WIRE um, and how they relate to my broader research traje trajectory. Um, so the first one that I started off with was a dual language immersion project. Um, dual language immersion, as most people probably already are familiar with, but it's a, form, a model of education where um, K through 12 students receive um, instruction in an, a language other than English, and they typically receive 50% of their instruction in each language. The most common um, non-English language of the DLI in the United States is Spanish, but there are also many other DLIs. Even in Wyoming, we have uh, Chinese programs um, in Casper, and so it's exciting, but um, Spanish is definitely one of the more um, I guess uh, people want, you know, Spanish DLIs the most. And so that's usually the language that they appear in. Um, and so we have DLI programs in Wyoming in four different um, cities across the state. We have them in Jackson, we have them in Casper, we have them in Gillette and here in Laramie. And when I first moved to Laramie three years ago, well, almost four now, well, yeah, three years ago, um, I enrolled my kids in school and I was so surprised to see that there was a DLI program because I had come from California and where there are a million Spanish speakers, there was no DLI anywhere close to me. And I come to Laramie, Wyoming, whitest place I've ever lived and there's DLI in Laramie. And I was like, wow, <laughs> this is so exciting. So um, I started going to volunteer in my kids' classrooms and I started noticing some really interesting comments and symbolism in the classrooms. Um, 
my son had a teacher who was from Spain and um, was definitely very preferential toward um, Spanish that came from Spain and to the point of it being very exclusive, like that was the only sp Spanish that ever mattered. There was only Spain represented in this classroom, no other place around the world. Um, there was a lot of like stereotyping of Mexican Spanish and Mex like representations of Mexicanism in his classroom. Like he would put on a sombrero and like a fake mustache and grab his guitar and be like, I am Mexican. And I just thought as a observer, I was like, oh, <laughs> this is so problematic for these kids who are in this class. They're in first grade. They don't know, you know, and they're absorbing all this information that they're receiving about what is, you know, what is it like to be Mexican? What is it like to be from Spain and how these languages are, um, you know, represented and stuff. And so I became interested in kind of doing a broader research project on, on DLI. And DLI is a very, very strong tool for kind of progressive educational policies, multiculturalism, multilingualism, like inviting these um, kind of critical pedagogies into the classroom and, and taking us away from kind of the Eurocentric or the English only model of education. But at the same time, um, there are these little kind of tidbits that still pop up, even though we're trying to be more multicultural and multilingual. There's also these things that are like, yikes, <laughs> that's kind of problematic. And so I was really interested in looking at that across um, Wyoming to see if this case that I was witnessing in Laramie was, was similar across the state or if it was just this one teacher who, you know, there's every, there's crazy people everywhere. <laughs> so, so I just didn't know um, what it was. So anyway, I got in touch with um, a bunch of the school districts and was able to start some observations. Um, but then right in the middle of my observations, um, that's when COVID hit. And so the schools closed. I couldn't go in anymore. Um, the projects got put on, on pause. I'm still working on a little bit of the data that I was able to get from that. Um, but it's the schools have still not opened for visitors. They were, of course, open for kids, but they don't allow parent or researcher obs observations. And so <laughs> I've been out of luck so far, but hoping to continue that project um, as soon as I'm able to get back into the schools. So then what ended up um, coming out of my wire fellowship was at the same time, as Conchita said, we have, you know, these many different projects going on at the same time. We don't just do one project at a time. So at the same time that I was looking at this DLI stuff, I was finishing up a book that I was co-editing on heritage speakers and study abroad. Um, and we, um, my, my co-editors and I had, had, um, began this project because we kind of noticed that her, um, study abroad is really, really important and promising for language acquisition. It, of course, it really helps students um, to acquire and improve their Spanish skills. But often um, study abroad programs are kind of geared toward a white middle class what's called an L2 or a second language learner, which means there's an assumption about a type of speaker that goes on study abroad. And now in our globalized world and more multilingual world, we have students of many diverse backgrounds going on these study abroads. And sometimes the host country, the host families or the institution or the people that they interact with in study abroad isn't, they don't always, maybe understand those dynamics and kind of judge harshly um, the Spanish of some of our multilingual students, including heritage speakers. So there's a lot of assumptions of like, if you're Latino, if you have a, a Latino sounding last name, what should, you know, how should your Spanish be? What should you speak? And what kind of proficiency you should have and things like that. And so there's some kind of, sometimes can be some negative experience for heritage speakers who choose to study abroad. And so we did this project on um, heritage speakers and study abroad. And so as part of that um, book, I finished up one of the chapters that I needed to write um, on dialect awareness and sociolinguistic um, competence, which is basically like how we interpret dialects when we're abroad. Um, and so that's what I, I worked on for my wire project and it did eventually get published. So now it's available 
And um, so that's out there with a little blurb saying, thank you for the support of the Wyoming Institute for Humanities. <laughs> so that's out there in press. And um, that was what came out of my project. So thank you again for this opportunity to share and I'll turn it back over to you, Nancy. Thank you all so much. That was so interesting. I've taken like all these notes just because I just, I find it fascinating how you all come to your, um, I think it was, Ch I think it was Chelsea. It could have been Irina that said like, you think that people who teach in Spanish, it was Chelsea. You like, you just teach, like you learn to teach Spanish. And once you're really good at that, and I wouldn't say I'm totally guilty, but I hadn't, I hadn't ever stopped to understand the breadth of the really cool things y'all do. So this was a very educational for me, for sure. Um, I just want to give a shout out to the audience and tell them if y'all have questions, please drop them in the Q&A or in the chat box. Um, we had one question about the book that uh, Joy mentioned, and it was The Elements of Academic Style, written by er Eric Hayo, and, and Joy dropped that into the chat so everyone has it there. But we would love for the audience to interact some with our panelists. Um, I'm wondering while we wait to see if we get some audience questions, if the panelists have any questions or observations for each other. So I wanted to ask Conchita about her project. Conchita just won um, an ANS research grant for a project called Cervantes and Friends. It sounds really fun. And I was wondering if you could tell us about that, Conchita. Well, it's uh, the same thing that I was saying before. Uh, actually, um, you know, uh, we were, I was working in other projects and uh, with Andres, we said, uh, we, we have been thinking about this project for a long time and I was not paying a lot of attention. And, I, uh, and we wrote a proposal and Andres said, let's send the proposal to a publisher. And I, and I told him, you know, we are never going to get published. We will not be published. So, uh, so, um, because I have realized lately, uh, I don't know if it's because COVID or um, it seems more difficult to publish now than uh, when I started like 10 years ago. I don't know why, um, but we sent a proposal and it was uh, peer review and everything. And uh, they, I mean, we haven't finished the book, but uh, they accept the, uh, the book, so it's going to be published and it's, uh, it's about, uh, the book is about friendship in different, not in the, the key shot, but in, in theater. Uh, when we think about Cervantes, we think about uh, Don Quixote and that's it, but he was a wonderful poet and a wonderful uh, drama, uh, dramatist, uh, I mean, a uh, play writer. And um, so it's going to be everything but the Quixote. Uh, so it's going to be friendship in the different uh, uh, novels and uh, plays that Cervantes wrote. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Awesome, thank you. Chelsea, I don't know if you saw the question in the chat about um, if you've worked with the school board for the, uh, the ASD number one VP for curriculum, have you had any interactions um, following up on or in response to your observations of the, um, the um, DLI classroom? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I loved um, Debbie Fisher is amazing. I, I have met with her a couple of times and she's helped us with um, an in-reach project that we, where we brought the DLI kids to campus um, to do a celebration with them. And she helped us with that. She passed out the awards um, for that. And it was really great. Um, I, I did one time mention um, some of my concerns um, that I saw, but at, after that, I haven't been able to um, get back into the schools for more observations. Um, and I don't want it to, to make it sound like I assume that this is going on with other teachers as well. I think that it, it was an isolated case, the problematic things that I was observing, um, but the other observations that I had made after um, that teacher, it was, it was never 
kind of like a, a repeated thing in, in other classrooms. Um, but I would like to definitely continue working with um, ACSD and um, working with their curriculum in the future. I think that that would be an excellent partnership. Joy and I are actually in um, partnership with the CASPER um, DLI program. They are working with us to try to um, establish a path for their DLI kids once they move past the, the once they exhaust their high school um, opportunities, the classes that they can take at their high school, they want to come to us. They want to be able to take college classes in high school. And so we're working with them to kind of create a, a good pathway. And I think that that would be something that ACSD could also do um, in the future if they're interested. I have a question, Chelsea, for you. Uh, is uh, different the DLA programs in Wyoming and that in other places in the US, like is very different from, for instance, New York, Wyoming or California? And what are the difference? So more or less all the programs are similar. Yes, they're very, very different. Um, so dual language immersion programs are usually, they can, they're classified as one-way immersion or two-way immersion. And the one-way immersion means that most of the kids are monolingual or very dominant in English and they're learning uh, the second language pretty much from scratch. There might be a few heritage speakers, but for the most part, it's an English dominant group that's acquiring the second language. And then a two-way immersion is where half of the kids are dominant in one language and half of the kids are dominant in the other or approximately 50-50. And so those, those are the kind of the two different models and that research has um, kind of uh, shown that the two-way models are to our, our better for kids that have a non-English dominant language. And so um, the kids, for example, that speak Spanish at home and come um, to the classroom, they get to be experts in half the day in this, you know, the Spanish portion. And then the English kid, the kids who are dominant English get to be the experts in half. And so it's more of a balance. Um, and so in states where there are a lot of multilingual populations, they can have more of that 50-50, that, that two-way model. However, in, in Wyoming, um, unfortunately, our population just doesn't really allow for that. It's a little bit more balanced in Jackson, for example, than it is um, in Laramie, Casper, and Gillette. But in those three places, it's definitely um, a one-way um, kind of street <laughs> for the most part. And so... Um, I think that it's a struggle, but it's definitely worth it to still keep doing it. I think there are some critics of one-way DLI programs that say, oh, these, this is just another elitist program that gives these white kids the ability to acquire a foreign language. And they're very critical of those, of one-way programs. But I think there's a lot of um, wonderful potential for one-way programs, especially in states like Wyoming, um, that you can, they, the kids can learn so much about multiculturalism, multilingualism, reaching out into the community, incorporating themselves. Um, and so I think that there's a lot of value in, in one-way programs too. Karina, I have a question for you about heritage language learners. When you were talking about the different kinds of language learners, I was thinking about the little bits and pieces of news I read here and there about the um, efforts to recuperate or to record and revitalize indigenous languages, the indigenous languages like Arapaho. And I'm wondering if you could, I'm not asking you to suddenly be an expert on those things, although if you are, I'd love to hear anything you'd like to say, but just talk a little more about heritage language um, learners and and how that how that process of learning a heritage language might connect with things like identity and community. Right, and uh, actually, it's funny because in our same cohort, there was a project by by uh, Professor Kasky that was working on video games to help with revitalization of the indigenous language here uh, that are indigenous to Wyoming. Uh, you know, and. Uh, a lot of, and partly what, what Chelsea can tell you too in her experience is that heritage speakers get a lot of stereotyping and a lot of uh, 
say uh, pejorative terms and sometimes they also get um you know uh their their language is less value in in a couple of ways that i can tell you and i i have i have my students have told me one of the ways is oh spanish is so easy it's these low class people that learn it so it has to be easy you know and if you know and and also that learning a language in general might be an easy thing and if if people that are immigrants and come here don't learn it is because they are lazy or they don't want to, which is a funny thing. And then and then the other thing that they experience is that, oh, you're bilingual, but you know, it doesn't matter. It's just because because you were born in, in a family that is a Nadi, you know, that has Nadi speakers. So it's like their ability with the language is less value than a lower actually ability with the language by a second language learner. And they experience this in the classroom often. Uh, furthermore, you know, when it comes to testing, uh, you know, from high school into, into um, high level credits here at the university, sometimes those, those AP credits that they get, they are judged harder. And it, there's been studies of this uh, than, you know, the same, mis they, they might make similar mistakes or mistakes that are actually orthographic or that are due to their, particular variety, you know, that I consider non-standard Spanish maybe, but the communication is fine. They communicate perfectly and they are just harder for those mistakes than the, their, their equivalent peers, um, second language learners who might actually make mistakes that make it really hard to understand what they really intend to communicate. Uh, but somehow it's like it hurts the eyes or something of the people grading those exams. Like I said, there has been a studies, uh, you know, comparing how, you know, different uh, uh, speakers are judged. And this, they can be facing these kind of things. One of the common effects, and Chelsea probably can talk more about that, is that sometimes they reject altogether the language, whether it's them or their parents, more frequently their parents. Would, would decide not to teach the language or not to speak it at home even because they worry that that might hinder their, their English or that it might hinder, uh, you know, just generally how they do in school. I don't know if this was an answer to your question or. No, it was wonderful. Thank you. And we have about three minutes left and I have a question I could ask, but Conchita might have something she wants to say instead. Mm -hmm. I have a question for Irene as well uh, about what is to be bilingual. Can we say is, is such a thing? <laughs> I don't know. Um, can you tell us a little? I, I'm not a lady. I could tell you, <laughs> I will make it lots of money somewhere else, probably. But <laughs> what is, I mean, there's a, you know, it's a, it's, it's rivers and rivers of ink on what is to be a bilingual. Um, there is a common, more or less accepted notion that a bilingual is someone that can communicate efficiently in the language, not efficiently, not necessarily accurately. Uh, there is also even a definition out there that is more about being bicultural than being bilingual, you know? So there is that debate too. Um, but if you ask the people, and if in, in the class that I teach that is a Spanish in the USA, I typically start a class with this question is, you know, and I ask them to go to their environment and ask the people around them what they think a bilingual is, who is a bilingual, what do you need to be a bilingual? And most people think that you need to have learned the language as a first language, both languages to be a bilingual. Like they somehow, or when you were a baby because you were living somewhere else, there is this notion of the perfect bilingual that acquire both languages at the same time. <laughs> uh, you know, and I think this is, if you ask people in the street, the majority of people without any training would lean towards this definition. But if you look in the literature, you will see all kinds of definitions and perhaps the one with some more traction might be, they just can communicate more or less efficiently if they need to. 
That was really interesting, Irina. It's this is not the session is not about me, but I spent six years living and working in Qatar. And so we had people that um, were tr often trilingual, um, Arabic, French, then English, sometimes quadrilingual. Um, and, it, and language there, especially because of English, was very much tied to identity. And there was a lot of community tension over when you had um, two parents who were like younger generation, like let's say in their late 20s, early 30s, who were bilingual in Arabic and English, and they would send their kids to an international school where first language was English. Um, then there was judgment around they're not going to be country enough or Arab enough. It was it was just so interesting and in, in some ways wonderful, but also heartbreaking just because of the tension to witness these questions of what it means to be bicultural and bilingual. So I just want to thank you for, for those comments. You know, and actually Conchita can can tell you, but where she's coming from in Spain, there is that debate also currently, you know, because I remember they were debating who could vote in their elections, you know, and one of the arguments was only those people that can um, talk their local language, their Catalonian, which is also an official language in Spain, you know, uh, and there's there's divisions and she might know more than I know about that, but but uh, I think, and actually my friends in linguistics in other departments, you know, that may not be Catalonian at all, had a very strong opinion about only the people that speak Catalonians are real Catalonians and only then should be able to vote in their election. So that was interesting. It, it, yeah, really, it really ties to community, like politics at the community level. It's, um, it's very interesting and complex topic. Um, Oh, I saw uh, Sonia had her hand up, but now I think she's popped out. So um, there's a couple of just fun comments in the chat that I will rely on our panelists to take a look at and respond to if they'd like. But just in the interest of time, I'd love to give Joy a few minutes to kind of make some broad final comments and then I'll say our final goodbye. Unmute, Joy. Thanks, everyone, uh, for being panelists today. And on behalf of the Modern and Classical Languages, I thank the Institute of Wyoming Institute for Humanities Research for sponsoring the four of us in this, plus Sonia Rodriguez-Hicks, who was currently in one of the, with the cohorts, and Becky Steele, who was in a previous one with a different language. Um, so I'd like to close with this reminder of what really all of us together have shown you today that humanities is about human ties, human ties. And you've seen that with the students who are, who are native speakers, who are heritage speakers, who are learning a language for the first time, and all of those things that have to be studied to help them move forward. Related to that is the dual language immersion style of teaching that we think is going to be the wave of the future and see how that that gets those ties to the community to the humans and the the humanity and all of us and then of course the more standard humanities type studies that also talk about human ties what's conchita doing friendship from, from the from the 1600s the the in the most sold novel in the world, that's human ties. And all that all that we do with our writing, with our studying, with our research, pursues this connection to the world and the important things of how to think, the critical thinking, the abstract thinking, and the ways that we tie together with our research and that we share writing with each other and the um, humanities cohorts were a wonderful way to tie us to each other across across the campus across subjects we never knew even existed and now we have friendships and that we continue to to forge those human ties together it's been a, a really really great privilege to be part of the wyoming institute from of humanities uh, cohorts thank you so all so much and thanks nancy for uh, thinking of us and including us tonight it's, it's been a real honor and a very fun privilege to be here with you all. So I'll thank 
Joy and Conchita and Chelsea and Irina, as well as Stephanie and Jennifer for a wonderful session. We will pick up, don't forget, December 13th, Going back to human ties, Dr. Tracy Owens Patton is going to be presenting her work in the Sandine lecture that evening on Zoom. So mark your calendars for more human ties. And thank you, Joy, for those amazing final comments. Thanks to our audience for being here. And we'll see you soon on another uh, Wire Humanities event. Thank you.